Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplify, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Now we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 20th of September 2018. And the topics we'll be covering today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. Now let us start with the first article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 9. Now what this article talks about is various concerns with regards to PhD graduates in the field of science. Now the first concern highlighted in the article is that there is a saturation with regards to jobs. In several fields of science such as chemistry, due to a large number of PhD graduates in that subject, but very few little new jobs being created. The second concern highlighted in the article is that there is an elongated training process for a PhD graduate in the field of science before that person becomes eligible or qualified to apply for a job in the Indian market. Wherein what generally happens in India is that first a person needs to get a bachelor's degree which may take up up to 3 years within the field of science and after that the person would have to pursue a master's of 2 years and after that an MPhil of 2 years then a PhD of minimum 3 to 4 years and after that various PhD holders also go for a postdoctoral which also takes up up to 2 years wherein in this process in India without taking any form of gap year a person may take up to 12 to 13 years just to become eligible for a job in India. And therefore, according to the author, a PhD graduate in the field of science in India goes through an elongated training process before becoming eligible for a job in the Indian market. Now, the third concern raised by the author is that after training for 12 to 13 years, a PhD graduate in the field of science gets very low entry-level pay. And the fourth and the last main concern highlighted by the author is that private companies in the field of science in India are still evolving and therefore do not have much capacity to ensure adequate level of jobs for PhD graduates in the field of science. So now hopefully up till you have understood the main concerns as highlighted by the author with regards to PhD graduates in the field of science in India. Wherein the first concern raised by the author is that there is a saturation in the job market especially in specific science subjects such as chemistry due to excess supply of PhD graduates but there is low job creation within that subject field. The second concern raised by the author is that PhD graduates in India have an elongated training process wherein a PhD graduate generally spends up to 12 to 13 years of being trained in the Indian education system and it is only after spending roughly 12 to 13 years that a person becomes eligible for the job in the Indian market, especially in the academic field. Now the third concern raised by the author is that even after spending 12 to 13 years, a PhD graduate in the field of science still gets a low entry level pay. When the author has given an example is that an assistant professor in a private college gets around fully around 8,000 rupees per month. And the fourth and the last concern raised by the author is that the private sector in the field of science in India is still evolving and therefore it has a low capacity to absorb new applicants in the form of PhD graduates in the field of science. Now with regards to this, the author has given two solutions. When the first solution given by the author is that PhD graduates should also develop other skill sets so that they are able to be employed in the business sector the journalism sector, the patenting office, among other fields. And the second solution given by the author is that available positions within the academic sector in India must be quickly filled. So now hopefully up till here you have also understood the concerns and the highlighted solutions given by the author with regards to PhD graduates in the field of science in India. Now this article and the explanation given this section would first be placed in GS paper 2 within the subsection issues relating to the social sector of education. And secondly, it would also be placed in GS Paper 3 within the section Economic Development and within the subsection Indian Economy and Issues Relating to Employment. However, the concerns and solution with regards to PhD graduates in the field of science in India should be seen within the larger sector of the structural issues that exist with higher education in India. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 9. Now what this article talks about is NRI bonds. And we'll try to understand as to what are NRI bonds from the perspective of your prelims examination. Now, NRI bonds in simple terms are bonds that are issued to non-resident Indians to invest money in. Now, the first aspect that you need to understand about NRI bonds is who issues NRI bonds. Wherein NRI bonds are going to be issued by the Reserve Bank of India. Now, the second aspect that you need to understand is what are the advantages of issuing NRI bonds. Where the first advantage of NRI bond is that it attracts foreign capital to the Reserve Bank of India. When what generally happens is that the Reserve Bank of India issues these NRI bonds. 
wherein these NRI bonds provide very high returns for investment and therefore become very attractive to NRI investors. And these NRI investors then invest in these bonds in the US dollar or any other major currency. And therefore these NRI bonds are then able to attract foreign capital for the Reserve Bank of India. And these NRI bonds generally have a lock-in period of more than two years. Now the second main advantage of these NRI bonds is that they are considered safe because they are being issued by the Central Bank of India, which is the Reserve Bank of India. And the third main advantage of issuing NRI bonds is that it may help in increasing the demand for rupee and therefore allows the rupee to appreciate against the dollar. Now the third question that you need to understand is why is the Reserve Bank of India considering issuing NRI bonds now? Now as you already know, the rupee is heavily depreciating against the US dollar and what the RBI wants is that by issuing NRI bonds, it may cause the rupee to appreciate and thereby stabilize against the US dollar. And the fourth and the last aspect about NRI bonds that you need to understand with regards to your prelims examination is what are the previously issued NRI bonds. Wherein in 1998, India issued the resurgent India bond. In the year 2000, India issued the Millennium India Deposit Bond. And most recently, India issued the foreign currency non-resident deposit in 2013. So now hopefully you've understood the main features about NRI bonds that are required to be remembered with regards to your prelims examination. Wherein the first aspect that you need to know is who issues NRI bonds, wherein it is issued by the Reserve Bank of India. Now the second aspect with regards to your prelims examination that you need to understand is what are the advantages of NRI bonds. Wherein the first advantage of NRI bonds is that it attracts foreign capital, wherein RBI issues these NRI bonds with a lock-in period, wherein these NRI bonds provide very high returns which attracts NRI investors. And these NRI investors mainly invest in the US dollar or any other major foreign currency and it is through this process of issuing NRI bonds that the Reserve Bank of India earns foreign capital. Now the second main advantage of NRI bonds is that it is considered safe as it is issued by a central bank of India which is the Reserve Bank of India. And the third and the last main advantage of NRI bonds is that it helps in increasing the demand for the rupee and thereby helps the rupee in appreciating against the US dollar. Now the third main aspect that you need to understand is why is the Reserve Bank of India issuing NRI bonds now? Wherein as you already know that the rupee is heavily depreciating against the US dollar. And what the Reserve Bank of India wants through issuing NRI bonds is to slow down the rupee depreciation so that the rupee stabilizes against the US dollar. However, you have to understand that this is a very temporary measure. And the fourth and the last aspect that you need to understand about NRI bonds is what are the previous NRI bonds that have been issued by India where in 1998 India issued the resurgent India bond in 2000 India issued the millennium India deposit and most recently in 2013 India issued the foreign currency non-resident deposit wherein all of these three times NRI bonds were issued so as to slow down the rupee depreciation against the US dollar now a question was asked in the prelims of 2010 which had asked the resurgent India bonds were issued in US dollar pound sterling and which of the following currency? Wherein the correct answer to this question is the douche mark. Now you have to understand as to whether the Reserve Bank of India would issue NRI bonds is currently news in transition. And we'll have to wait and see on how the Reserve Bank of India moves forward. Wherein if the Reserve Bank of India does decide to issue NRI bonds with a very different name, then it would become relevant with regards to current events of national importance with regards to your prelims examination. Wherein previously a question has been asked in the prelims examination of 2000 which had asked on the resurgent India bond that was issued in 1998. Wherein during this period the issue of NRI bonds by the Reserve Bank of India was a current event of national importance. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 12. Now what this article talks about is India South Korea relations. Now India South Korea relations would be placed in JS paper 2 within the section international relations. First within the subsection India and its neighborhood relations. Now you have to understand that South Korea lies in East Asia and therefore India South Korea relations should be seen within the purview or as a part of India's relation with East Asia. And apart from this it would also be a part of effect of policies and politics of developed countries on India's interest. Where in particular this article talks about the new southern policy of South Korea. Now we had covered India-South Korea relations in detail in the August edition of the Focus magazine where if you take a look at this map, South Korea is located in East Asia with other countries such as Japan, 
China, Mongolia and others. And India-South Korea relations have a special strategic partnership wherein this special strategic partnership is based on deep-rooted historical and cultural bonds, shared universal values of democracy and free market economy, and of rule of law, wherein in addition to this, both India and South Korea support a peaceful, stable, secure, free, open, and exclusive rules-based region, wherein this region is generally assumed to be Indo-Pacific. Now, South Korea is considered a partner in India's Act East policy, and similarly, South Korea considers India a central pillar to its new southern policy, wherein similar to India's Act East policy, under which India wants to maintain good relationship with countries of Southeast Asia and East Asia, South Korea has also started what is called a new southern policy, wherein it wants to maintain good relations with countries which lie south of South Korea, such as countries of South Asia such as India, countries of Southeast Asia, among others. Wherein after understanding the basic principles of India-South Korea relations, let us understand the basic contours or basic features of India-South Korea relationship. When the first recent aspect in India-South Korea relationship is that both countries would begin with capacity building programs in Afghanistan, wherein India and South Korea would explore tri-priority partnerships for development in third countries. Now this simply means that India and South Korea would partner with third countries such as Afghanistan and others, wherein both India and South Korea would form joint capacity building programs in these third countries. Now the second aspect of India-South Korea relationship is of Princess Suri Ratna, wherein it is considered both in South Korea and in India that Princess Suri Ratna was a legendary princess of Ayodhya who went to Korea in around 48 AD and married into the royal Korean family, wherein a large number of Koreans, including the royal family of Korea, trace their ancestry to this legendary princess from Ayodhya. Wherein what has recently happened is that India and South Korea have agreed to work in upgrading the monument to Queen Suri Ratna in Ayodhya wherein this monument is a joint project so as to celebrate the common heritage or the shared heritage between India and South Korea. Now the third basic aspect of India-South Korea relationship is of economic cooperation, wherein South Korea intends to partner in India's flagship initiative such as Make in India, Digital India, Startup India and in the Smart Cities project, wherein what recently happened is that Samsung, which is a South Korean company, built what is one of the largest mobile phone manufacturing plant in India. And apart from this, South Korea has also agreed to support India's infrastructure development projects under the Korea's Economic Development Corporation Fund and under export credit. Now the fourth aspect in India-South Korea relationship is of trade cooperation, wherein what is currently happening is that India and South Korea are in negotiation so as to upgrade the currently existing comprehensive economic partnership agreement that exists between India and South Korea, wherein what recently happened is that both countries decided on an early harvest package wherein under this early harvest package, both countries would look for key areas for trade liberalization and after identifying the key areas for trade liberalization, it would become a part of the upgraded India-South Korea Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. When what has currently happened is that India-South Korea already have a Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, but they are now re renegotiating it so as to include more products for trade liberalization, wherein the upgraded Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement would have much more key areas than the original one for trade liberalization. However, what has currently happened is that the negotiations for this upgraded agreement has been going on for so long. So what both India and South Korea have decided is to form an early harvest package, meaning that any key areas that has already been agreed upon for trade liberalization such as marine products, both India and South Korea would allow for the trade liberalization of such key areas under the early harvest package so that the agreed upon areas do not have to wait for the negotiations to get over and for the upgraded economic partnership agreement to be formed. Now the fifth important aspect of India-South Korea relationship is of technology cooperation. When what has happened is that India and South Korea have signed a memorandum of understanding or an MOU on future strategy group. Wherein under this future strategy group, both India and South Korea would work on technologies for commercialization so as to reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. Wherein India and South Korea would cooperate in the research and development of Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, big data, smart factories, cyber security, 3D printing, electrical vehicle, precision medicine, brain research, new communication networks such as 5G and cloud computing, apart from various other technology fields. Now the sixth aspect in India-South Korea relationship is that South Korea has supported India's membership to the nuclear suppliers group. Now India's membership to NSG is currently being opposed by China. 
and membership to the nuclear supply groups is based on the consensus method, meaning that if there are 10 members in a group, then all 10 members have to agree to let a new member in. And that is why the support of South Korea for India's membership to the nuclear supply groups is important. Now the main concerning issue between India and South Korea is that the trade potential between both countries is below expectations. Wherein India and South Korea are Asia's third and fourth largest economies, but the trade between both countries is just at a small $20 billion per year, and therefore the trade potential between both the countries is below expectations. Now, the eighth and the last aspect that you need to understand about India South Korea relationship in the recent context is of the denuclearization of North Korea, wherein India and South Korea have both supported the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. When in India and South Korea would work together to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and the provincial proliferation of delivery system of weapons, particularly to terrorist and non-state actors. Wherein what you should know is that there have been strong links that Pakistan aided in North Korea's nuclear program, while North Korea aided in Pakistan's missile development program. And any cooperation between India and South Korea to stop the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery system would be beneficial to both these countries vis-a-vis Pakistan and North Korea. So now hopefully you've understood the basic contours or the basic features of India-South Korea relationship. Now you have to understand that you need to see India-South Korea relationship within the purview or as a part of India's relationship with the neighborhood of East Asia. Wherein an important aspect that you should remember with regards to prelims examination is that Queen Suri Ratna is associated with which of the following country? Wherein you know the correct answer to this question is a South Korea. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this editorial from page 8. Now what we'll try to learn from this article is various steps that can be undertaken for climate resilient water management. Now the first step highlighted by the authors is to have advanced controlled releases from dams. And these advanced controlled releases from dams should be based on accurate weather forecasts. Now let's say you have a 100 meter dam. Now what is the international practice is to maintain a water level which is below the maximum height. So let's say for a particular dam, the agreed height at which the water should be kept is let's say 75 meters. So what happens in international practice, so if it rains around this dam and the water level increases to 80 meters, what the dam manager would do is release 5 meters of water. And apart from this, if in an international scenario accurate weather forecast is given, which says that it is going to rain around this dam and this expected or forecasted rain is expected to increase the height of the water by 5 meter, then what the dam manager would do is to have advanced controlled release, wherein before it even rains, the dam manager would release 5 meters of water and therefore the height of the water in the dam would reduce to 70 meters and so that after it rains, the height of the water in the dam would then increase to 75 meter. But what has been the practice in India is to keep the water at the fullest level and when it rains, the water is released. But what happened in Kerala was that too much water because of the continuous rain was released and this release of water from dams caused flood throughout Kerala. Now the second step highlighted by the author is that there should be basin scale water modeling in India. When if you take a look at this image, if you consider the main river channel, the tributaries of the river, where two rivers are meeting or what is called its confluence point and the area of the watershed of the river is called the river basin. So any rain that falls within the river basin area will flow with the river and any rain that flows outside the river basin will not flow into this river. And what the authors are recommended is to have a basin scale water modeling wherein this would include linking interbasin transfer wherein let's say one river basin has had excessive rainfall and what the authors are recommending is to move the excessive water from one river basin to another which would be a good step in flood water management, linking canals to storage structure, wherein what can be done if that there is a particular river basin which receives excessive rainfall year on year, then a canal can be made for this river basin which would transfer the excessive water which causes flood to particular storage areas. The third recommendation given by the author is to form simulation model of river basin specific flooding. The fourth recommendation given by the author is to ensure that local streams in river basins have clear waterways, meaning that these local streams should be without encroachment so that whenever flooding does occur in that area, the water has a free flow to go through. 
The fifth recommendation given by the authors is to include local bodies such as panchayats in flood risk management. When what is currently happening in India is that flood risk management is basically undertaken by the central government in cooperation with the state government, wherein the National Disaster Management Authority coordinates with the State Disaster Management Authority. And in this case, the local bodies such as panchayats which are on the ground are not included in flood risk management, wherein it is the local bodies such as panchayats which have the strongest capability of reaching the place first and ensuring management of the floods. And therefore, the National Disaster Management Authority and State Disaster Management Authority should have a cooperative mechanism with local bodies. The sixth recommendation given by the author is to allow means of saturation of water to the soil. And this saturation of water to the soil should be without any blockage by large infrastructure projects such as airports. And according to the author, this saturation of water to the soil should be without any blockage from large infrastructure projects such as airports. And the seventh and the last recommendation given by the authors is India should improve weather forecast and prediction modeling. So now hopefully up till here you've understood the seven steps given by the author so as to ensure a climate resilient water management. But in regards to your UPSC slavers, these steps would be placed in GS paper 3 within the section environment and within the subsection conservation. And apart from this, this explanation would also be placed within the section disaster management. Now a question was asked in the GS paper 3 of 2016, which had asked the frequency of urban floods due to high intensity rainfall is increasing over the years. Discussing the reasons for urban floods, highlight the mechanism for preparedness to reduce the risk during such events. When you can highlight these reasons as mechanisms that can be undertaken for resilient water management during urban floods, such as the recent one in Kerala. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 7. Now the reason this article is in the news is because the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved the revised cost estimate of the dam rehabilitation and improvement project. Now the purpose of the dam rehabilitation and improvement project is to improve the safety and operation performance of selected existing dams in India, such as in Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Jharkhand, and in Uttarakhand, wherein the improvement of the safety and operation performance of the selected dams would ensure safety of downstream population and property. And apart from this, it also seeks to strengthen the effectiveness of the dam safety organizations. Wherein the strengthening of this dam safety organization would ensure that dams are safe from structural and operational point of view. Now another aspect that you should understand with regards to this project is that it is being done with financial assistance from the World Bank. So now hopefully you have understood the three main features of the dam rehabilitation improvement project wherein the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved this project. And the purpose of this project is to improve the safety and operational performance of select existing dams such as in the state of Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Jharkhand and Uttarakhand. And apart from this, this project also wants to ensure the safety of downstream population and property. And apart from this, this project would also ensure the strengthening of the effectiveness of the dam safety organizations. And the last aspect that you should understand about this project is that it has financial assistance from the World Bank. Now with regards to the UPSC slavers, this article and the explanation given in this section would be placed in GS paper 3, first within the section economic development and specifically in the section infrastructure. And secondly, this project would also be placed in the section disaster management. Now the question for your practice is the dam rehabilitation improvement project is being supervised by which of the following organization? And the correct answer to this question would be given in the end section of this video. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken the first article from page 1 and the second article from the editorial page on page 8. Now what both of these articles talk about is the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill or what is popularly known as the Triple Talaq Bill. So what we'll do with regards to this article is first understand as to what has been the recent update and after that we'll understand as to what are the key provisions of the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill. And then lastly, we'll understand what are the issues that have been raised in this editorial with regards to this bill. Now let us first understand as to why is it in the news. Now what has happened is that the union cabinet has approved an ordinance which makes instant triple talaq or what is called the talaq e bidat first as a compoundable offence and secondly as a criminal offence wherein this bill makes triple talaq a criminal offence wherein instant triple talaq is a cognizable offence. 
where in under a cognizable offence, a husband which has given instant triple talaq can be arrested without warrant. Apart from this, it also makes a person who commits instant triple talaq to be in jail for maximum of three years. And apart from this, this bill also makes instant triple talaq a non-bailable offence, wherein person can get bail only through court. However, a magistrate may grant bail to a husband after hearing from his wife. And apart from this, this bill also makes instant triple talaq a compoundable offence, meaning that it is a provision that allows the wife to withdraw a complaint against her husband or approach a magistrate for dispute settlement. And thereby it means that compoundable offences are those offences in which the person who has filed the case, meaning the wife in this case, withdraws the complaint and enters into a compromise for dispute settlement, while in non-compoundable offences, no compromise is allowed. Now the second aspect about this bill that you should understand is that the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill was enacted after the Supreme Court in the Shaira Banu case had declared triple talaq as null and void and asked the central government to pass a law on the subject. So now hopefully up till here you understood that the Union Cabinet recently approved an ordinance on the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill wherein this bill makes instant triple talaq which is called talaq e bidit first a compoundable offence and secondly a criminal offence wherein as a criminal offence it is cognizable meaning a person who has given triple talaq can be arrested without warrant and it contains a maximum jail period of three years and apart from this giving triple talaq becomes also a non bailable offence meaning a person can only get bailed through the court or by the magistrate after hearing from his wife however this bill makes instant triple talaq a compoundable offence meaning that compromise is allowed between the husband and the wife, wherein in non-compoundable offences, compromises are not allowed between the person who has filed the case and the person against whom the case has been filed. Now the Muslim Women Protection of Marriage Bill was enacted after the Supreme Court in the Shaira Banu case declared triple talaq as null and void and asked the government of India to pass a law on the subject. So now hopefully you've understood the key provisions of this bill. Now let us understand the various issues that have been highlighted with regards to this bill. When the first issue with this bill is that it makes a civil offence a criminal offence. Wherein it has been argued that divorce between a man and a woman is a civil matter and a civil matter should not carry a criminal offence. The second issue raised with this bill is that the Supreme Court has already declared triple talaq as null and void. That how can an invalid act which has been declared null and void be criminalised? And the third main concern being raised with this bill is of child custody and of substance allowance, wherein the bill has not cleared on how a child custody would be undertaken in a case of instant triple talaq. So now hopefully you've also understood the issues that have been raised with regards to the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill, wherein this act which makes divorce which is a civil matter a criminal offence. And apart from this, the Supreme Court has also declared triple talaq is null and void. Then how can this bill criminalise an act which is actually invalid? And apart from this, this bill does not address the issue of child custody and of substance allowance. Now you have to understand that this news is currently in transition. We will have to wait and see on how the government of India moves forward with this bill and what will be the reaction of the Supreme Court if this bill is passed. But hopefully you have understood the various key provisions of this bill and the various issues that have been raised as against this bill. Now apart from this, what you should also understand is what is an ordinance. And we'll try to understand as to what is an ordinance from the perspective of your prelims examination. Now the first aspect about an ordinance that you should remember with regards to your prelims examination is that Article 123 of the Constitution of India grants the President certain law-making powers to give out ordinances. And the second aspect that you should remember is that Article 213 grants the Governor of a state certain law-making powers to issue ordinances. Now the third aspect that you should remember is that ordinances are given when either of the two houses of parliament or the state assembly is not in session. The fourth aspect that you should remember is that an ordinance which has been given out shall have the same force and effect as an act of the parliament or a state legislature. The fifth aspect that you should remember is that ordinance to become a law needs to be passed by both the houses of parliament or state legislatures. Wherein if a question is asked in prelims, as to whether the Legislative Council votes on making an ordinance into a law, you should remember that Legislative Councils do take part in passing an ordinance as a law, wherein this law then has to be agreed upon by the President or the Governor. 
and this has to be done within six weeks of the reassembly of the parliament or the state legislature. Now the tenth aspect that you should remember about an ordinance is that it lapses if it is not passed within six weeks and it means six weeks from the reassembly of the parliament or the state legislature. So now remember all of these 11 aspects with regards to an ordinance for your prelims examination. Now question for your practice is with regards to ordinance consider the following statements and you would be able to answer this question with the explanation given in this section and the correct answer to this question would be given in the end section of this video. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now one of the aspects that we continue to highlight with regards to preparation for your prelims examination within the syllabus context of geography of the world wherein questions have been asked in previous prelims examination as to which city or town was located in which country or which ethnic group belongs to which country wherein you can prepare for these questions by first highlighting the various cities or towns or ethnic groups that appear in the headlines of the Hindu newspaper within the world section. So for today there is one town which has been highlighted in the headlines of the Hindu newspaper and this town is called Palai wherein this town of Palai is located in Sri Lanka near the major town of Jaffna and the reason the town of Palai is in the news it is because India has said that it is not involved in developing an airport in this city. However what is required for you to know with regards to this news is that the location of the town of Palai is in Sri Lanka. Now as a recommendation this is an exercise that you should continue for every day wherein you can find out as to which city, town or ethnic group has been mentioned in the headlines of the world page. In any newspaper that you follow such as the Hindu, the Indian Express or any other paper that you follow and this exercise would help you in preparing for your prelims examination in 2019 for questions that are asked in the section geography of the world as to which city or town or an ethnic group belongs to which country. And now with this we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today.